Sam Edwards. I work at Capital One, and I'm going to be talking about advanced HTTP mocking with WireMock, and specifically on Android. So just a baseline, WireMock runs as an HTTP server. So if you think about it, your Android app normally talks to a web service over HTTP. WireMock can replace that web service completely, and you talk via your Android app to WireMock. So and you basically take that dependency of having an actual HTTP server out, well, and replace it with this one. So you can run WireMock in a few different ways. Uh, one, you can actually run WireMock in your app. So you can programmatically say, create a new WireMock server, start it up, and it's running within your code. So um, that's one way. Another way is just on the device. So you can have a separate app that you use where, for some reason, you start WireMock on there, and you're talking to it over HTTP. You can also start WireMock on your laptop, and we'll show that in a demo later on. But you can have your Android app talk to your desktop, because as we're seeing, all these are just HTTP, right? You're, you're talking over that. And finally, you can run it on a remote server, on the cloud, wherever else. But WireMock is still going to function the exact same way. It's just running in different places. Uh, if you do talk to WireMock uh, and it's running in within your app or it's running on the device, you're going to talk to it over localhost. It's kind of weird to think about at first, but because you're starting a server on the device, if you're, if you're connecting via your app, you're actually connecting over localhost. And it runs on port 8080, as you see there, because that's a default port. However, that's configurable. And you're also able to configure the HTTPS port if you want to use that. If you do run it remotely, you just have to use the IP address or host name of whatever machine you're actually running WireMock on. So the history of WireMock, uh, it was started in 2011 by Tom Akers, who's a developer out of London. Uh, it is open source. It is Apache 2.0. Uh, the problem was this version 1.0 of WireMock was not compatible for Android, while it was a really awesome tool that was used mostly by um, back-end developers. Now, this guy here, Michael Bailey, uh, works in AMAX, and he did an awesome talk at the Google Test Automation Conference in 2014. And it was titled Espresso Spoon WireMock Oh My. And it showed this amazing combination for Android testing of using WireMock and Espresso and Spoon to create these awesome reports. And uh, the little byline there is I stopped worrying about and loving Android testing. So, WireMock is this really cool piece. However, the work they'd done at AMAX was closed source. So, they weren't able to open it up, and not everybody could use WireMock out of the box because WireMock 1.x was incompatible with Android. So it comes along to end of 2015, early 2016, I had used WireMock in other settings, like as a back-end developer, and I wanted to bring it on Android. Um, so went ahead and looked at it. There's a new 2.0 branch, and I worked with Tom, and we were able to just change a few method signatures because a lot of the work he had done for WireMock 2.0 allowed it to run on Android. We just had to make a few changes, and we got it to work. So it is now available. The 2.x version <laughs> works on Android. And this is the documentation for WireMock, which is really comprehensive. But the Android section links to my blog because I wrote a blog post about it when I got it to work. So um, last year, I presented a talk called Espresso, a screenshot is worth a thousand words. We heard that last year instead of this talk because that's the one that got accepted. I applied the, this one this year, and this got accepted. So now we get to hear the counterpart of this kind of whole story of similar to what um, Michael Bailey did at Amex, but it's this combination of WireMock and Espresso for this like really reliable uh, Android testing suite. Uh, ideally, what you get, and this is a screenshot from last year's slides, is you get you know all green on all of your instrumentation tests. And if you want to add in screenshots, you can do that. If you watch that video, you can see some uh, information about that. Now, the goal is when you have really stable tests, is to be able to run them every single time you make a code change. So hopefully, you have con con continuous integration set up. So every time you make a pull request or a change in your code, you're going to run that um, on Jenkins or in Travis, Buddy, Build, Circle CI run yourself on Firebase Test Lab, Amazon Device Farm, or your own custom solution. But the goal would be that every single time you run your tests, they pass, unless you change something in the code that makes it fail. So there's a lot of things that can make your tests fail. But if you take HTTP out of that equation of something that causes your test to fail, then your, your tests are a lot more stable. Because if you're actually hitting your real server, let's say that you know, it just goes down, or somebody's deploying a new version, then you're going to get these failed tests where at the end of the day, you're writing these tests for your Android app to see if it's functioning the way it should. Because your app is just talking over HTTP, you don't need to hit the real server. You can hit a WireMock server. And that way, you know it's going to be the same HTTP response every single time, and your test should pass. If they don't, it's not your HTTP fault. Sorry. So why would you want to mock HTTP calls? Um, like I said, for testing, determinism and reliability. Every single time you run your test, you want it to behave the exact same way. Uh, you want to avoid rate limits and server costs. Some APIs that you hit may say, you can only call me with this API key every five times every minute. 
Or maybe I'm going to charge you one cent every time I call your API. So if you use a mock HTTP server, you're still getting back that same signature and the same response you would have gotten, but you're, you're doing it yourself and not hitting the real service. So you can run these tests in parallel as many times as you want, and they all operate independently. Um, what's also nice is if you're mocking HTTP calls, you avoid the modification of state, like in a database or on the server. In a banking situation, you could think if I'm depositing money or withdrawing money, then both of those things are going to change the end state that's in the database. So if I'm going to run the test again, I have to go update that and change it. Where if in Wiremock, you have it set up, you don't have to worry about that. Every single time, you're going to be returning the responses that you are expecting. Uh, this is also important for edge cases and error scenarios. Uh, if you think about testing most of the time, you're thinking about your happy path that you test. But if you test um, weird cases like we'll go into, where it's just 500s, 404s, maybe weird HTTP responses coming back, you can test that because you don't want your test to crash. And what you'll find sometimes is you feel like you handle that scenario. You tried it once, but you're always testing happy paths. However, if you actually write tests that uh, exercise all these error conditions, if somebody changes something that would cause it to crash, you'll catch that. It's getting really dark. Uh, also, if you mock your HTTP calls, it's going to be really fast because it's running right there. It's not having to hit a back end uh, like database or anything like that. You're just hitting your Wiremock server. <clears throat> and now this question is, might be confusing just reading it, but why mock the HTTP server? So I'm saying that we should mock over HTTP, right? So it leaves your application, it's going over HTTP, and then we're mocking on the other side. One way you might think about mocking is, I need to call this API. Well, let me just return a Java mock and not even call the server. I'm saying it's important to call the HTTP server because you can exercise your full networking stack. So if you're using OKHTTP OK and you have a bunch of interceptors, it goes through all the way through that the same way it would in production. And then you're testing, communicating with the real server. So um, this is important because you can test all of your networking stack. It's also good because you don't need to have knowledge of the inner workings of your application. This is important for a QA member that comes by and wants to do something, or a testing member, or just a new person that joins your app. If they want to look at your tests, they say, oh, well, what is the API returning? How does the app behave? I don't care what your underlying HTTP implementation and what's happening there. They just worry about, here's the response, and here's what should happen. And if you really wanted to, you could swap out your HTTP implementation. This was actually an issue for us when we upgraded from Retrofit 1 to Retrofit 2. Because we had wire mock on our tests, we didn't have to do all these crazy method signature changes. It was just already mocking all the HTTP responses. And uh, you can use recorded responses to create representative test case. So because you got back a response from the server, you have that recorded. You can use that within your test, and you know that's exactly what the server will return. And um, yeah, you can test all these error scenarios. Um, when should you use HTTP mocking? As I've been saying, it's awesome in Android tests. Um, it's very valuable there. It allows you to run them really fast. You can run it. I like to say it in a submarine, but really it's out in the, cl in the cloud. It, just, it can run on any device, whether it's connected to anything or not. The server's literally running on the device. And so um, it's really important in tests. And for a mock flavor of your app, if you don't want to worry about a testing environment, having the connectivity to it, or it being up, you can actually just use your app in like kind of an offline mode and get all the functionality you want. I don't recommend using HTTP mocking in your Android builds, but somebody will probably have a reason to use it, so that's fine. But generally, I don't recommend that. Uh, here's an example of an espresso test that will go ahead and stub that when we call, uh, we'll stub to say a get request with the URL equal to the category Nintendo and the items, then we'll return a response at the status 500. So in this case, it's an espresso test that's going to test when we get a 500 response, what are we going to do? So first of all, in the test, I go ahead and say, hey, I want this to, re to return this response. And then I'll click on the thing I wanted to, and at the end, I'll say, make sure that the uh, view with the text networking error is actually displayed. So this is something that would be really challenging to do without a mock server. Like you could try to do it via Java mocks and so forth, but all those benefits that I, I outlined earlier, um, hopefully it would help. Here's an example of that test running that you just saw. Uh, so we'll run the app, we'll click on the category, and then you get the 500 error. So I'm able to assert that networking error came up and I could try all these different permutations and combinations. And because I'm using a mock server, it's super instantaneous. Um, just a note too, if it's like networking traffic like this and it's working on the JVM, because WireMock is just a Java library, you can run it in a pure unit test. So if all your networking stack is an OKHTTP OK or retrofit and, and um, decoupled from your Android code, you could just run it in a J unit test. And it runs a real server. So just think about that. All right done a lot of talking right now of like what HTTP mocking is and everything like that, but I want to talk about what is wire mock. 
And I feel like this image is the best description of what Weiermach is. Uh, this is a Swiss Army knife. It's kind of like the tool that has every tool you'd ever need in it, right? So uh, Weiermach is chock full of features. It's been around since like for what, how many years now? Seven, six years. And uh, really stable and really well proven. It's used throughout the industry. And now it can be used on Android. Uh, what kind of backs how Weiermach works is this concept of mappings. So the Weiermach server is running out there. And really, it's just a Java servlet running. Uh, it starts up in Jetty, which is a Java servlet container. And it's, it's basically a Java app that's running. And inside of there, there's an in-memory list. That are, each one of those things are called mappings. One thing would be a mapping for when I call a git to the URL hello, then it should return back the contents hello. Kind of a zoomed in version of this, or a zoomed out version of this, would be like this big box here is a whole Wiremock instance. And inside of there, you have all the list of mappings. So here we have a git to hello, a post to hi, or uh, any sort of method to goodbye. And you have, these are basically our rules. Our mappings are our rules. So whenever I call into Wiremock, it'll look through these and say, OK, what was the request? What response should I return? And these mappings can come from three sources. They can come from file-based mappings, which means they're literally files on the disk that get read in that say, oh, here's what my mapping is, and it gets loaded into memory in Wiremock. You can use the REST API, which is one thing that's really cool about Wiremock, um, because you can just make a post request to it and load a mapping in there. And so that means you can actually use Wiremock from any language. I did a talk on this at a dev fest, but you can use it from Node, you can use it from Ruby, from Clojure, whatever you wanted to. Um, and then lastly, via the JVM, which is what you'll probably use on Android, because you can programmatically just create that server and talk to it there. So what does Wiremock mapping look like? Uh, just like this. So first of all, you have the request. So this is the information that it's looking for in the request to match for this mapping. So if the request comes in and it's a git request and it's hello, then Wiremock knows to return this response. So it's going to return a response of status 200, the body hello, and uh, the content type of text plane. All right. So we've talked about these three different types of ways to load in mappings. There's file-based, the REST API, and then JVM. Now let's talk about recording these file-based mappings. Um, the way you would record any sort of traffic is you have to like listen to it, right? And so Wiremock has this concept of proxying. We have your Android app on the left. It talks to Wiremock, which then talks to the service you actually want to talk to. So you have to be kind of like man in the middle to listen to any traffic to do recording. In this case, I'm using an S3 bucket for this demo, so it's only going to be get requests, but then we can actually see it going through a lot, real live server. So when we actually run the app in a record mode, as the traffic goes through, it'll be recorded. And it'll be recorded to two directories, files and mappings. So files is actually the response bodies that come back. So the actual response body content that came back from that request is what's stored in files. And there's a file for each one. And then mappings is exactly what you saw earlier. It's that if this is the request, here's the response. So there's two files for every single uh, call that's recorded through Wiremont. If you wanted to go ahead and start up record and record file-based mappings to the disk, you can do it in the Wiremock server, which is, looks pretty complex. But you're essentially saying, Wiremock, start in this directory. Uh, here's where I want you to store the files. And here's where I want you to store the mappings. And after that, you start it up and say, go ahead and proxy all my traffic to uh, my shopping app. And then from there, Wiremock knows I'll proxy everything, and I'll save it to these two directories. Um, you can also start it via the command line. Uh, this stand, there's a standalone jar version, which is a jar file that contains all the dependencies for Wiremock, and there, therefore you can run Wiremock on the command line. So let's see a demo now, though, of um, recording traffic on Android. <coughs> so come in here, and what I'm going to do is I'm showing you now. This is our shopping app. Uh, we're looking at the device file explorer. So this is the file stored on the emulator itself. Right now, there's no Wiremock folder. I'm going to go ahead and launch my shopping app, though, which is our demo app. You'll see we have traffic here. And this is our home page. And it got back a response that had the list of categories, because this can be kind of a generic shopping app. So I'm going to go ahead and synchronize this folder. And now you'll see there's a Wiremock folder with files and mapping. So those two directories I talked about, files is actually the content that was re uh, the response body content, and mapping is that metadata information. So let's look at files. If we look at here, it's very straightforward. It's basically a just an array has three items that are JSON, the labels, Nintendo, Sega, and Atari. Perfectly maps. And if we look at the mapping file, we can see that if a request comes in for slash categories, and it's a get, then I'm going to return back a 200 with the content that's found in that other file that we just looked at. So that's the response body that's going to come back. And then here are all your headers. Oops. And this probably doesn't make much sense, but these are all the headers that actually came back from S3, because I wanted a way to statically host some of this content. The good news, this doesn't make sense too much in our case, but 
because we wanted to record exactly what was coming back, we got that. So hopefully in your case, when you're talking to your application server, you'll get the headers that you actually want. So that's recording. Continue on. So yes, we have file-based recording and playback on Android, but there are caveats to this. First one is you must configure it, those two directories of files and the mappings to actually be on the SD card or external storage. Um, the reasons for that is because your assets directory is not writable. Like it has to be on a, Wiremock is kind of just knows about files and so that has to be on the file system. Um, so the recommendation for getting started was to be, would to be don't necessarily try to do recording on, on the Android device. It is valuable and there are use cases for it, but it's going to make you run into complexity you don't want to deal with. So go ahead and just use an emulator like I'm doing and run Wiremock on your laptop and we're going to see a demo of that a little bit later. And that's going to be the easiest way to get started and feel confident and understand how Wiremock works. And as you've been seeing, Wiremock can run in any of these platforms and it functions the same way. So it doesn't matter where you run it. Um, just a little tip if you didn't know too, if you're running an emulator on a device, uh, the machine that it's running on is always accessible via 10.0.2.2. So if you hit that IP address from your emulator, it'll actually connect as like local host to your computer. So this is the way I'm going to be showing that demo off later. Um, now that we've recorded these uh, mappings on, onto the SD card, let's go ahead and see what it looks like when we play it back. Um, what's going to happen is the Android app is now going to talk directly to Wiremock and not do any proxying. It's going, when Wiremock initializes, it's going to read from those two directories that are on the SD card, uh, files directory, which has those response body contents, and the mappings, which are basically the rules of what they should match. Um, we basically just started up saying, here's our root directory that has files and mappings, or if you're on the command line, you just say start Wiremock, and it knows what directory it's running in and uses those. Um, one cool thing that we'll show off too is you can actually view all the mappings that have been loaded into memory. I know it was kind of weird or hard to visualize how that looks, but you'll see here what that looks like. So let's do a demo of the Android playback. So in order to not have to copy off the SD card, I've already put some recordings here in my asset directory. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm just going to change my app. I just kind of cheated here a little bit, but we're just going to go to playback mode now. In the demo, it's a little bit easier though. And so what this is going to mean is it's going to copy these assets that we see here. So this is a all the re those four responses, one for each category and one for the main page, and it's going to serve all of them. All the traffic that we're doing is going through Wiremock and is going to be the result of what these are. So, so each of those responses generates a pair of files? Um, I'm not sure Sorry, exactly. Tell us, Sorry, it's really close timing, so I'll, I'll answer at the end. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to prove to you this is the case. So if we go to Atari here, we see there's a few games. Um, I'm going to go ahead and change this first name though. So if I go into Atari and I go into its files, I can then modify the contents of this file. So instead of breakout, I'm going to put DroidCon New York City and then I'm going to relaunch. And when we click on Atari, we'll see this first item that says breakout now will now be DroidCon New York City. So you can see you're modifying in this case the, the actual response body that came back. Um, so Atari, and there it is. So now you see DroidCon New York City. So you've completely changed the way that you're the HTTP response that your app is receiving. And you can see in testing, this is really cool. It's, it gives you a lot of power to be able to say, this is exactly what I want back, and I'm expecting this, and it's going to be the same every time. Um, so uh, you also have uh, not only the, the actual response body content, but you have that mapping that I've been talking about. So in the mapping file is that description of, if my request is this, so if it's you know Atari and it's a Git, then return these things. In this case, instead of a 200, I'm going to say a 400, and I'll launch it again. And what we should see is when we go ahead and we uh, click on Atari, we'll see that it was a networking error and there was a 404, or I guess 400 in this case. So Atari, and there we go. And this is specific because if I clicked on Sega or Nintendo, it's still going ahead and serving it from my normal wire mock. So it's only that one HTTP response. Um, well, yeah, one thing I want to show is the, the mappings that you can see. So it's really hard to see on a emulator or Android device, but there's a special admin endpoint, underscore, underscore admin, for any instance of Wiremock that you're running. They basically picked an endpoint that was so obscure that you should never use it. And inside of here, you see exactly kind of what we're seeing. I don't know how to highlight it on here, but um, your request for categories, if it's a git, then return this. It's exactly what we've been seeing. And so these are everything that's loaded into Wiremock. There should be four of them here, I believe, that go down to the end because we have those four files. So there's total four mappings loaded into memory. Um, all right. 
So next we're going to talk about stubbing more. So what is stubbing? Stubbing is the act of creating a mapping we've been looking at programmatically. So we've already looked at file-based stubbing options, um, but now let's look at what JVM looks like real quick because that's what we're going to be doing in our Android apps primarily, but then our demos will be on the REST API. So in the JVM, we'll do presentation mode, um, <clears throat> this is what it would look like if you wanted to say, when I call hello, return back, um, hello world. So let's break it down. It's a very nice DSL or like readability in um, Wiremock. So in this case, it's using the builder pattern and it's saying stub for, so that's the act of stubbing to create a mapping. When I call a git to the URL equal to hello, then you will return a response with the header content type text plain with the body hello world. Now, if you just read that to me, stub for git URL equal, it, it's completely readable and it's, it's very easy to understand. So the syntax that they put into Wiremock and the and the amount of effort they put into this API has been amazing, so um, it makes your test very readable as well. The result of that is like we've been seeing. It's just the request. If it's a git to hello, then this will be a response. So no matter if you're doing it from Java or you're doing it from a file, at the end result, it looks like this in the mappings setting of Wiremark. <coughs> now the REST API we're going to be doing some demos on. That is pretty much the same thing. Um, we can do that, and we'll do demos because we're going to be starting up an instance on this machine. Uh, so let's go ahead and start that, where it's the standalone jar we'll be using, and as I said, it's configurable ports. So use our terminal here, and I already have it set up to say we're going to start the Wiremock standalone jar, and we're going to proxy all of our traffic to our S3 bucket. So I got it started up, and now Wiremock is running on port 8080. It's proxying all the traffic here, and we're going to uh, not record because we're not in record mode. So if I went ahead and looked at my mappings right now, localhost 8080 we'd see we have one mapping, which says if any request comes in, I'm going to proxy that traffic to my bucket. So that's, that's what's happening right now. All right, um, let's go ahead then and see the next thing. So now we're going to do some demo of uh, stubbing via this REST API. Now, uh, we already started it up, and everybody hopefully knows what curl is. It's basically a command line way of making HTTP calls. And in order to do this demo, I'm going to do copy and pasting of curl commands. So uh, in this case, it's that one we've been showing on over, over and over, but if I call a git to hello, it'll return back a 200 with hello world. This makes a post request, so I'm saying a post request to the endpoint, it's the Wiremock instance, admin slash mappings. So I'm basically saying, hey, put this mapping in there, it then adds it to the list of uh, mappings that Wiremock has in memory. So I'll go ahead and take that, paste it in. Now if I check in here, I have two mappings available, and you can see the hello one is here. So if I go ahead and access that, we'll see it is now hello world. So using the REST API, we're just adding a mapping just like we would in Java or based on the file. It's just another way of doing it. I don't want to update Keynote right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can, uh, so Wiremock can return a string body, which is kind of what we've been seeing. I'm going to use the Android app just to prove to you that this works via your Android app as well. But when we call the Nintendo category, I'm going to return back just uh, one item with the label question mark. So we'll go ahead and run that. So that mapping is now loaded into memory, and I just need to change my uh, application so it's connecting to the laptop instead of doing playback mode. So in this case, I'm using that 10.0.2.2 .2 URL to connect directly to my laptop, which is running Wiremock. So we just did that stub, which was, um, we're going to return a label of question mark. So here it is, Nintendo, and now question mark. So you can see we, we modified, it, everything's proxying over to the S3 bucket. So we should have got all our normal stuff. But I said, when you call this exact API, do this for me. And so all the traffic's there, but I just modified one thing, which is really powerful. Because if you're just testing or playing with your app, but you're like, you know what, I really need to test this manually, but I want to make sure this one thing comes back uh, in a certain way, you can just only change that one response. Um, you can also in here uh, send a JSON body. We're going to say that the DroidCon app is there. So if I go ahead and run, go backwards. I have a not perform an app, but it remake, remakes the request as soon as that activity is loaded. And you can see DroidCon New York City is there with its wonderful logo. We also have uh, the ability to do a base64 response body. So this is a way to encode binary data as a string. So if I go ahead and add that as a wire mock mapping, and then I load Nintendo, the decoded version of this <laughs> base64 string is actually just base64 encoded. But what it's showing is you can represent a data uh, in a binary way via Base64, or binary data in that way. Um, and then lastly here, if we want to get a 500 response for this, 
Um, this is just a mapping that returns 500. So I can go back and then click Nintendo and then I get my 500 networking error. All right. So it's kind of cool to look at your mappings inside of that like JSON admin endpoint, but it gets pretty complex. So there's a wire mock extension. So instead of having to look at something that looks like all these things, you can just load up the wire mock extension. And if you wanted to, you can add your wire mock rules here, but I like using the mapping section, which shows all these mappings that I've added programmatically. So I added the hello mapping, I've added Nintendo mappings for the 200 responses and then 500. You may be looking at it saying like, well, it looks like they're the same mappings. And it's true, like if you, if you actually override one, it uses the most recent one, but you also have the ability to edit or delete a mapping. And that's because each one of these has a UUID associated with it. So WireMock knows, hey, I wanna go delete this one. Or I wanna update this one. <clears throat> right, complex stubbing. So what you've seen so far is like, okay, yeah, it's, it's mocking, that's pretty cool. But there's more complex features that you can use with WireMock to make it really powerful. Uh, one thing is URL pattern matching. So I don't know how easy it is to see here, but basically any category that I call, so any like detail page I was showing, I want, when I call that, I wanna return back a response. So this is powerful because it's using a pattern, which is gonna be a regular expression. So basically any category, and then I'm looking, it doesn't matter here, and then it's gonna end in items, will return back the category of kittens. So I'm gonna go ahead and stub that, and then we will click on Nintendo and get kittens, and Sega and get kittens. So, as, and as far as doing um, complex mappings, it's really nice to have the power to do regular expressions, and it's built into WireMock. So it's not anything you're having to custom code, you just use reg regular expressions. Um, you can match based on query parameters. So a lot of the times you'll have a URL that has like a question mark, this equals that. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna show a demo where if you go to the protected endpoint and you have a password, then it has to match password. So if I go here in the browser, which is the easiest way to show, I'm going to show localhost, protected, and the password is something wrong. In this case, it proxied my traffic order to S3 because it had no mapping for it. But if I say password is equal to password, then I have a mapping for that. And I specifically return, how did you know that my password was password? Um, so that's really cool that you can do it based on query parameters. And you don't have to, if there's multiple query parameters, you're not worrying about like parsing the string and figuring out what's what. It just knows this, it can do ma parameter matching for you. Uh, other complex, map, complex mapping can be mapping based on headers, which is important if you have two versions of your API. Like if you send out in your request header, this, I need version one or I need version two, you can actually map both, uh, have mocks for both of those. Uh, another thing is if you have two logged in user instances, they're usually gonna send different authorization headers. It's like the same endpoint, but one's gonna say like, my token is one, two, three, the other one's four, five, six. And if you use complex stubbing with header matching, you can say, oh, well this is, we know this is user one because it has uh, the header uh, one, two, three, then anyway, you can use that. And you can also match on the request body. So we've been talking about the URL, the whether it's a post or a git, and the parameters, but you can actually look at the request body itself and say, is it exactly equal to something? Does it contain a string? Um, is the JSON body equal? And the JSON body matching is really cool. It uses a library where if you had a user object and it had a first name and a last name, it wouldn't care if the last name and then the first name was there or the first name and the last name is there. This may seem trivial, but when you get into it, it's like, at the end of the day, it's a JSON object. So when you deserialize it, you know it's just gonna be an object that has first name, last name. You don't care what order it is. And if you use WireMock in a setting where your iOS team is using it and your Android team is using it or something like that, at the end of the day, we don't care what order it's in. So this is something that can be really complex if you run into that scenario and it solves a problem for us, or it could be a problem. Other things you can do is simulate errors and latency. So um, you can have an empty response, a malformed response, chunk data, then close. In this case, I'm gonna return a malformed chunk response by just saying I want a fault. So I'll go ahead and stub that, and then we'll say Nintendo, and it will say, hey, there's this weird thing happening. Um, if we looked at it in the browser, it'll tell me exactly what it is. So if I went to category Nintendo items, it'll say error, incomplete chunk encoding. Now how many times have you tested that? Do you care to test it? I don't know. but it's a way that probably could crash your application if you don't handle it correctly, especially if you're trying to parse that data out. So it's really nice to be able to have this built in so you can make sure your app isn't gonna crash because crashes are what make your app ratings go down. Um, you can set specific delays for endpoints. In this case, it's going to take a 200 millisecond or two second delay, and then it's gonna return back the string better late than never. So we'll go ahead and stub that, and then we'll go back to Nintendo. One, two, there it is better late than never. So that's really cool that so you can sim simulate like latency or race conditions or things of that nature. 
Um, along with delay, you can also do it at a more uh, global level if you wanted. Um, but in this case, it was a sub-specific delay, so it's just one specific thing. But you could do it at a global way. Um, you can also set up random delays, and there's different algorithms you can set up. But you can say like between zero and ten seconds, do it randomly, or there's like log uniform distribution things that are way more complicated than I understand. But there's ways of doing it randomly. Um, one powerful thing that you probably will say when you get into mocking is, if I call the same exact request, how do I get back different responses? So if I'm just calling the same thing, get me my shopping list, give me the items on the shopping list, how do I get something different back each time? What I've seen a lot of mocking frameworks is, when you call it, it's just going to say like you can return item one, two, and three, and it'll just return those in a certain order. Um, in this case, this example shows that, um, it, <clears throat> but I'm going to show you how you can differ from that as well. All of these are just to get requests to items. And, but what Wiremock does, it has this concept of states. It's not just response one, response two, response three. Uh, Wiremock starts always in the started state. And because I'm in the scenario shopping list, I basically say, if I'm in started, um, I'll go ahead and serve this response that just has one item. And I'll say my new state is now two items. So for the shopping list scenario, I'm now in the state two items. If I come over here and I'm in the required state of two items, I'll then serve this response and then say, I'm in now the state of three items. And then finally over here, if I'm in the state of three items, then I can say serve, serve this response and then go ahead and say now I'm in the required state started. This is straightforward, and not straightforward maybe, but um, this is how people would reach, like, like re return these in order. So it would be like one, two, three, one, two, three. But because we have all this complex matching in here, you can almost create logic within your server the way that your backend would. So if you create a lot of different scenarios, when you got to the second one here and you're at two items, let's say your request body actually had something slightly different, or your, um, anyway, you could go in different different ways. Because it's a scenario state, your states could go in this direction or in that direction. It doesn't have to go linear, linearly. So you can do some really advanced stuff. Uh, I don't know how many people use Makito for JVM testing. It's a wonderful library. One thing that you commonly do is verify that you made a call. So like you have a class that you want to make sure you interact with. And so you can do the same thing with Wiremock. You can say, I want to verify that a get request was called to category Nintendo items. So this will make sure that one API call was um, made to that endpoint. And we know that because Wiremac has a list of all the calls that were made through it, and it can validate it. We can also say that, uh, make sure that it was called three times, or we could get this entire list of all the uh, events that Wiremac served. So we can do whatever other validations. Um, you also have the ability to do programmatic resets. So you can reset all the mappings, and it'll clear that out. Or you can reset the scenarios, so it'll go back to the started state. So these are important because you don't want to have to start your server and stop your server. You can just programmatically restart it. So now some like opinions. Uh, what kind of stubbing should I use, file-based or programmatic? My answer is you should use programmatic responses. We saw kind of via the REST API. We could just throw those up there, and it, it was pretty nice. Um, you can save time by avoiding the consuming recording playback cycle. So if you think about, like, I have this test case that I want to make sure I, I cover. If I go out and then record it for my testing server, it comes back. I have the files. I copy those in my project. Um, let's say I have 100 tests. I have to do that every single time. If you did it in a programmatic way, you could hopefully automate it so that you kind of follow the same pattern and do it slightly differently. Um, one thing that's super important is generating time-sensitive data. If you're Facebook and you need three posts that happen within the last day so you can show it in a certain section, if you recorded mocks off the server and it's just a flat file, it's always going to say whatever data it was recorded on. So it's, it's super important for creating time-sensitive data and things of that nature. Um, you can iterate through, so when you're doing programmatic mocks, let's say that you have three user IDs, right? And each, you can basically just iterate over it like uh, a lit for list or a for loop and go through and say, when this is called, return this, when this is called, return this. And you don't have to go out and, and write all those uh, file-based mappings by hand. And one thing that's really big is hold, holding a programmatic model uh, and for asserting things. So. Typically, a lot of you probably use retrofit, and there's a response model that you have that comes back from the server. Now, if you create a builder pattern for that response model, you can basically generate exactly what you want to come back. Then you can take a JSON serializer, like JSON or Mashi or something else, take that exact object that you want to get back, put it on the HTTP server with Wiremock, and then when it comes back, you already have a copy of the data you're expecting. However, it actually came over HTTP. So you have a copy of the data you know you want. You know it's coming back over HTTP. So when you get into something like, let me validate this profile pages here, you can go to like crazy amount of assertions in Espresso Test. You just pass in, hey, I'm looking for this um, user profile, and then it can assert every single property that's on that screen. 
So it's a lot more context than if you just like had to manually write those in, and it's a lot more maintainable. So it is a uh, upfront investment, but I feel like if you're going to really go heavy in this, you save a lot of time in the long run, and you get more stable tests. So I'll, I'll turn, turn it around now. I'll say file-based mocks are actually better than programmatic mocks. <clears throat> and I will say this because you can record. So just out of the box, like I don't have to go write any special code to go programmatically create all these mocks. Uh, I can just record them, and I have them on file. I can just play back, and I have a mock server. So when you're getting started, this is fantastic, and I highly recommend it. There's no reason to do things the hard way. Uh, and this will hopefully sell you on Wiremock and make it something that you want to use. Um, it's also perfect for simple cases, like that one scenario where I was just like, I only want to return a 400 for this response. Everything else should go through. If I create a file-based mapping for that, that's great. I now just only get a 400 back for that because that's the only thing I care about. Um, and if you're working with non-developers, a lot of testing teams don't have internal knowledge of how you'd programmatically stub things then file-based mocks is a good way to start because they can see exactly what it is on the file system and have a better understanding of what's happening there. So caveats for use of Wiremock on Android. Um, so in, when you're bringing in uh, Wiremock, it's meant to be run uh, kind of, not server-side, but for web applications. And so when you bring it in, you have to ignore the, uh, or exclude the dependency for the Apache HTTP client. That's because we used to have the Apache HTTP client with an Android, um, and then that went away with API 23, and there's some weirdness. We now have an old version of OKHTTP OK that runs underneath Android. Um, so what we end up doing is down here later on, we end up saying, let's go ahead and use the, um, the Android version of the HTTP client in its place, which has all the, um, the correct method signatures to match. We also ignore the JSON module and the ASM module because they're already provided with Android. All right, 73,000 methods. So if anybody's scared, they can walk out now. Um, but this is the methodscount.com, I believe it is, or .net. Um, this is the number of methods that are contained within the Wiremock library and all the things that come with it. And so if you're looking at this and you're worried if you're using enums, this is much scarier. Um, but Wiremock has been around for six years. It is a Swiss Army knife. It does tons of things. And um, yeah, you're only going to be using it in tests, and you're only going to be using it in mock flavor. So as long as you can get over the fact of using multidex inside of your tests or in your mock flavor and not in your real app, then Wiremock can work for you. Um, so one of the, some of the things that make up the reason why it is 70 some thousand uh, methods is you're using uh, Jackson, which is a uh, JSON serialization library. It's pretty heavyweight. You're using Guava. You're using uh, the Apache Commons libraries. You have a version of Jetty embedded. There's a bunch of stuff in there, like the JSON matching library to do that stuff. It's really powerful things, but comes at a price of a method count. I don't know, if you're a pragmatic developer, you get all this stuff. So just kind of weigh what works for you. So recommended but not required is a min SDK of 21 because we have multi-dex supported um, by default there. And you can set multi-dex enabled to true. And final thoughts. So I made a few recommendations, but I'll leave you with this. Um, so go home and play with Wiremock as a desktop tool. So the way I did it, run it on your local machine and take an emulator and just hit it on 10.0.2.2. It's really cool. You'll start seeing all the mappings being recorded. You'll start being able to modify stuff, and you'll say, like, this is, this is really valuable. And you'll know that you can run it on Android if, when you want to. Um, another recommendation is, before you start integrating in your app, evaluate other libraries. There are other libraries that do HTTP mocking, um, so make sure you look at those. Some of them are Mock Web Server, which is, comes from the OKHTTP OK group. It's another dependency, but you can use that. Um, <clears throat> it's really, really basic. You can add more logic onto it, but it does not nearly as much as Wiremock does out of the box. And then there's RESTmock, which is something that you can add onto Mock Web Server, which gives it a better DSL, kind of like we're seeing, where you can more, have it more readable, but it's still not as advanced as Wiremock. So those things are there, and if you're worried about method count, they are a lot lower. Um, there's awesome uh, tutorials on Castor.io about Mock Web Server as well that I ended up watching. Um, and then OK Replay is a um, way of mocking your OK HTTP stack. So instead of actually mocking to a web server, you can um, go ahead and just add an interceptor that will return back a response. This is done by Airbnb. Uh, Felipe Lime does it, um, and it, it looks pretty cool. I haven't looked into it much because I have a solution that I like. Uh, Retrofit has a way of doing mocks, Behavior Delegate. I tried it first because I didn't want to go to the server. Um, at first, but I came around and uh, it was really hard to do uh, error scenarios is what I found. So like just being able to say this is the HTTP response I want and getting it was a lot easier than having to go through retrofit. 
And if you wanted to, you could just use Makito, right? Like instead of going out to your networking layer, you could just say, when you do the, call this, return this. So yeah, 70,000 methods, uh, just multi-dex and get over it. It's not in your production app. It just makes your life better when you're testing. So leave you with this quote that I made up. It says, <laughs> don't carry a Swiss Army knife if you only need a knife. But if you need a Swiss Army knife because you have a really complex app that you want to test and do awesome things with, then, you know, carry it in your pocket. I don't have a knife, don't worry. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. And you can check out all the code on GitHub. Uh, right now, the master branch does not have this code, but it's in a DroidCon New York City branch. That's exactly what you saw. So thank you.